This is a presentation from Winchester Academy. Welcome to Winchester Academy's virtual fall series. I am Maggie Jones, and I am the program committee chair of Winchester Academy. Thank you so much for tuning in, for listening to us on the radio, watching us on TV, or tuning in on Facebook or on YouTube. We're really grateful to the city of Wapaka, and especially to Josh Werner, for making this space available to us and for br providing this technology that we, that we all needed to make this happen. Let me tell you ab about our next program for Winchester Academy. It will be three weeks from tonight on November 9th at 6.30 p.m., the same as tonight. Dr. Jack Rhodes will be our presenter. He will be uh, presenting a program called Why Westerns Endure. Tonight's program is sponsored by Vance and Ann Linden. And as a reminder, at the end of our program tonight, at about 7.30, we will have a question and answer session. So if you have questions that you would like to ask our presenter, please uh, keep them in your minds or write them down. And you can submit them via Facebook Live, our Facebook Live site, or you can call on the phone the telephone number for the questions and answers is 715-942-9917. That number again is 715-942-9917. Our program tonight is titled Record Rain, the Hydroelogical Cycle. And our presenter, George Kraft, is a, a free-range hydrologist who's been working on issues of groundwater sustainability in Wisconsin. He's also an emeritus professor of water resources and former director of the Center for Watershed Science and Education at UW-Stevens Point. His ongoing research and his outreach have been devoted to how unmanaged groundwater pumping is drying central Wisconsin's lakes, streams, and wetlands. And I present to you now, Mr. George Kraft. Thank you very much, studio audience, folks at home. So today, tonight's presentation is going to be a, about a few things. It's going to be about groundwater, and it's going to be about lakes and streams and wetlands, and how groundwater is the thing that feeds all of these things. And then it's also about high-capacity well pumping that takes water out of the ground, and when you do so, it lowers water levels, lowers stream flows, and lowers uh, uh, levels in, in lakes as well. So. Um, Let's start out with a couple G whiz things uh, here. Uh, I'm going to talk about really how wet it's been because uh, you know I want you to have something to be able to talk about over coffee tomorrow, and then also something that passes for humor in my profession here, which is the everybody know what the hydrologic cycle is. Well, this is the hydroelogic cycle. So let's take a look at the precipitation record for the last bunch of years. If you live on a, a lake or you uh, recreate lakes or streams. You see, water levels are out of sight right now. Even water levels in many of the uh, lakes that had, were uh, decimated by groundwater pumping from uh, irrigation wells just a few years ago. We are in record territory. No, we're not in record territory. We're, we're beyond record territory here in terms of how much precipitation we get. So uh, I have a slide up right now. Um, the Wapaka precipitation records are, are a little spotty. This one is from Stevens Point, which isn't too far away and pretty much has the same kind of data here. Uh, so the, this record here goes from 1930 to, to 2020 here, and a, a few things about that uh, record. The last six years have all been in the top 20 of the, of the last 90. We haven't had an average year or a below average year since 2013. It's been wet year, wet year, wet year, wet year, wet year. 2019, we had a whole foot above our normal precipitation amount of, of 32 uh, inches. The last uh, time we had a decent drought year was 1988. We, we've had dry times and drought times, no doubt about it. 2012 had an incredibly dry summer. 
but uh, you know, a good drought year we haven't had since 1988. That's how, uh, what it's been. So to, to illustrate this a little bit, looking at this, this year by year thing makes it a little difficult. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you another graph and each dot on the graph is like a five year average of precipitation. So for instance, we take 2001 to 2005 and that's one dot, 2002 to 2006. And I'm gonna do this because hydrology isn't very exciting by pulling a, a curtain back and hopefully add a little intensity here. So if we go way back here uh, into the 1930s and you know we've all heard stories about how dry the, the 30s are, and that red line that you see in there is, is the average precipitation of 32 inches. Uh, it, it was a dry time. It was a dry time in, in a lot of the country and in the central sands of, of Wisconsin. And then if we look at the next bunch of years, what happened, so we get to the end of the 30s and uh, to, the, to the late 40s, we had this amazing uh, a wet period uh, that happened at, at, at that time here. A whole string of years where we were considerably above average precipitation. And then we go through another string of years here starting uh, in, the, in the late 40s and going maybe to the uh, mid 60s where we had year after year after year of, of below average precipitation. And this is when we also start having some good hydrologic records and so we could see you know, what water levels were during some of these very, very dry, dry periods here. So that brings us up to you know, the, late, the late 60s or something like that. Uh, and then what do we get? We get a, a, a long period going from about 1970 to about 2010 here, where we have pretty cyclical ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs. We're not in general as dry as we were in the, the 50s or as, wet as we were in the, in the late 40s, but uh, we, we just kind of cycle like that. It, most people in my profession, you know, given our age and things like that, that was the, the normal that you know, we, we came to assume. Well, what happens, uh, let's take a look at one thing. I'm, a little later on, I'm gonna be making reference to a, a series of years, which I'm gonna call the Big Dry. Uh, and the uh, uh, blue uh, uh, dotted line there is around these years. This is a catastrophic time where a lot of lakes and streams and wetlands in highly pumped areas uh, dried catastrophically. Water levels went da way down, stream flows went way down, sometimes uh, disappeared, and you can see it really wasn't that dry compared to our, our past. So what's happened the last bunch of years now from uh, about 2013 until present? Wow, okay, we, we, are, we keep going up and up and up. People say, uh, well, you know, what, what's gonna happen here? And I, can't, I, I keep saying it can't be above average every year, and yet really that's the way, it, what, what way it's been since uh, uh, 2013 here. And you can see, you know, we are in the what is five year period in history. Uh, so, you know, no wonder we're seeing uh, water levels uh, so high, stream flows so high, even in lakes and streams and, and wetlands that were uh, severely pumping impacted. There we go. So we haven't talked about how water works just yet. So let's, let's talk about the hydrologic cycle and groundwater uh, in the hydrologic cycle. So the groundwater stuff is the, blue uh, in, the, in the subsurface in this cross section through the uh, landscape here. And uh, it's you know, just the water that saturates the spaces between sand grains. And you know, it's, uh, it's the water then that uh, uh, nourishes lakes and streams and wetlands, and it's the water that we pump out of wells. Um, the, you know, where, does, where does the groundwater come from? It comes from local precipitation. We've been talking that we get about 32 inches of rain a, a year. Not very much runs off directly into streams and leaves the landscape, uh, but rather most of it soaks into the ground. Plants soak it up at the roots and send it back to the atmosphere, about 20 inches of it, leaving roughly about 10 inches to percolate through the soil and become part of the, the groundwater. Uh, the groundwater just doesn't sit there though, but it flows from the landscape for where it comes in to streams where it's just trying to get out of the out of the watershed and 
go someplace else, go downhill. If um, we have a place like this dotted line shows here that is a low spot uh, uh, in the topography and it goes below the top of the groundwater, well, that's where we get lakes from. Uh, and we, we should, can think about lakes and many wetlands as really just depressions in the, in the water table. Uh, and, and we gotta really think about these things, lakes, uh, streams, and wetlands and groundwater. We have to think about them as a single resource and we have to think about managing them together. So the scenario I just showed you was a no pumping scenario. Let's look at what happens when we, when we pump groundwater. So the first thing you'll see is that the, there was a high capacity pumping well put into this drawing by the USGS artist here. And when we pump groundwater, water levels declined in the aquifer. You know, we are taking water out of storage, we're doing something else with it. And so it's like a bank account, there's gonna be less there and water levels decline. Uh, we could see at the same time that that water that was going from the left to the right to that east stream there is getting intercepted by the well. And because it's getting intercepted by the well and going someplace else, the stream is deprived of, of water too. Because the water level has, uh, has gone down and the water level is attached to the uh, lakes, the uh, lake level has gone down as, as well. If we pump that well really hard and it's located very near a stream, we might actually reverse the flow of the uh, groundwater out of the stream and, and into the well. So that's the nuts and bolts about how this hydraulic system works. To put too fine a point on it then, there's two big wheels that control uh, water levels and stream flows and, and, and lake levels. One big wheel is how much precipitation we're getting. We get a lot of precipitation, water levels go up. We get a little bit of precipitation, water levels go, go down. The other big wheel is groundwater pumping. Groundwater pumping takes water levels, levels down. Uh, pump a little bit and only goes down a little, pump a lot and it can go down quite a bit. Okay, so this is, this is what passes for humor in my profession, I'm afraid, is the hydro-illogic cycle now. Uh, Hydro-illogic cycle is just what, what humans do, you know, uh, when something's out of sight, it's out of mind. And I think people that are in other professions uh, have this, the same thing. I imagine f financial planners have the same thing, you know, trying to tell people, save for retirement, this and that. Well, it's a long ways away, uh, they don't worry about it. But the hydro-illogic cycle here, we can apply it to flood times and we can apply it to to drought time, so when there's a flood, oh my gosh, you know, we have devastation, we have financial loss, sometimes loss of, of life, it costs us uh, millions of dollars to undo the damage, um, and, and then what do we do? We said, well, you know, we should do better, we should uh, quit building in, in floodplains, we should stop farming in, in, in floodplains, and yeah, 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 all that sounds good, and then uh, some years go by, and some more years, and it's like, well, the, the awareness and possible action on the flood side turns to apathy and, you know, uh, if these things don't happen, except on 10 or 20 year time scales, people forget about it till the next disaster happens and then we, we relearn the message all over again. And it's the same with drought, uh, that, you know, we think about managing for these things and we shouldn't put too de much demand on our water resources during drought times, and then we have some good times, there's plenty of water, nobody worries about this, and we move along and forget about some decent, doing some decent progress against these kind of issues. So, uh, but, you know, uh, case in point here, we've had a lot of discussion the last few years about high capacity well pumping and the effect on lakes and streams and wetlands. With all the precipitation we've been getting, uh, all water is high, uh, lakes and streams that are not impacted by groundwater pumping and those that have been uh, uh, very impacted by pumping. And so this is Long Lake in the town of Oasis, east of uh, uh, Plainfield. In 2020, I just took this the other day. Um, 
but this is what it looked like in 2007. And will we forget to, you know, to, to work on this issue about how to make our groundwater use sustainable and consistent with healthy lakes and streams and wetlands? We'll see. We're coming to some politics on this sooner than later. Okay, so let's talk about the Wisconsin Central Sands here. And just to give you some landmarks here, uh, Wapaka County, about the western third or so, is in the uh, Wisconsin Central Sands. And you can see where Stevens Point, Plainfield, and uh, the various counties are over here. Um, a few things about it, the Central Sands, it's about 80 miles long and maybe about 50 miles wide. Um, the, the region has some 600 miles of, of trout streams, many of them, uh, you know, very, very prized high class waters. And we have about 100 lakes that are at least 25 acres in, in size, so we're a real water rich area. Uh, the hydrology on this thing is that precipitation falls across the whole landscape of the central sands, of course, uh, soaks into the ground, becomes part of the groundwater, and then tries to get the heck out by traveling to the nearest stream. Again, if it hits a low spot on the topography, we have a lake, and we like those. Um, this area is the most intensively uh, pumped in the state. Most of that water goes for irrigation. And thus it has been the focus of groundwater pumping policy and politics in, in Wisconsin. So uh, when we uh, you know, visit a, a, a creek or a uh, lake and we have a nice time with our family or a little uh, fishing expedition or how about this, this summer for kayaks? I mean, kayaks are everywhere, okay? All these things, including kayaks, they're all dependent on groundwater. Without groundwater, we wouldn't be having any of this kind of fun. So most of the groundwater pumping in the central sands is, is for irrigation. Uh, and, and so we need to get into a little bit of history of the uh, irrigation where we are with it right now. So conflict over irrigation uh, actually starts in the 1930s. And this is a time when uh, we, we're not pumping water out of the, the ground. This is a time when farmers are putting uh, big sucky hoses into streams. And uh, my friend Justin Isher with a potato farmer says, okay, you know, and had a, a four cylinder engine out of a Model T or something and a pump and you could irrigate a few acres uh, with that. Uh, th th this became a problem be because streams were getting dried, like right now, catastrophically, and you could see this. The Attorney General got involved, and they start issuing a, a permitting system for uh, stream, stream withdrawals, and then kicking people out of these things. No, you can't do that. Uh, our, all our water is part of the public trust in Wisconsin. You can't damage the this, this stream uh, for other users. Uh, in the 1950s, then, we see new technologies become available for uh, doing irrigation and for taking groundwater out of, out of the ground with, you know, big, massive kind, kinds of wells. And I think this migrated here out of uh, uh, Nebraska. Part of it, too, is we learned how to fabricate aluminum during World War II, and now we can make irrigation machines out of this stuff. It's you know, all, all pretty cool. And now when you, you know, you go back and look at old newspaper accounts and also testimony at the, um, at the state capitol, there's a lot of debate and discussion on water, how we should manage it, who gets to use it, and to, and to what degree. Here's a couple of endpoints in, in that debate here, one from the Isaac Walton League here, that the public will not stand for destruction of streams. We have the water now, but what will we have if we pump it out at a faster rate? So the kind of conservation side of this thing is that, you know, you know, pump it, but let's be cautious here. Uh, on the other side of it, we, you know, we have the agricultural interest saying, no reasonable person is concerned about this. This is an area of unlimited water. We knew better, hydrologists knew better uh, back then. Much information vital to writing a new workable code is lacking. So that was, you know, in the late 50s. And then we didn't start talking about groundwater again until we got into the 2000s. 
We just, we just punted on this year after year after year. Uh, anybody remember what happened in the early 2000s why we started talking about groundwater? Of all things, it was the Perrier business. Uh, oh, somebody with a French name is coming and pumping our, our water. And, you know, and actually, if you would have figured out jobs per gallon, it wasn't a bad deal um, compared to a, a lot of uses. It's a question of whether you can do it sustainably or not. Uh, but we didn't make much progress on, on it in the early 2000s, and we are still kicking that can down the road. So let's kind of look at some more of this uh, history here. Uh, 1950, we only had three high-capacity wells in uh, the Central Sands. By the time we get to 1960, we have about uh, 90 uh, of them. You know, pretty, pretty sparse uh, uh, across the landscape here. And then uh, in the, in the mid-60s, there's this fellow named Ed Weeks. And Ed is a uh, United States Geological Survey hydrologist. Uh, Ed is still around as, as far as I know. I had some communication with him uh, a, a little bit back. And he studies the Little Plover and the irrigation uh, impacts on it. And so remember, there's just a handful of wells around the Little Plover at that time. But Ed and his crew, they did some phenomenal stuff. Uh, they intentionally put a well right next to the stream uh, and pumped it until the stream went dry, just to make the point that these two resources are connected and you can't manage one without the other. Uh, he did some other pioneering work calculating, you know, for each field that's irrigated at a certain average rate, how much will stream flow uh, go down in this, in this basin here. Uh, he also gave us some tools that we could have used to start managing water withdrawals with respect to the health of lakes and streams. And this wasn't done with computers and stuff like we would do now, I'm sure it was slide rolls and graph paper, but he gave us the framework to, uh, to do that. So 1970 comes along, wow, we're up to 449 high capacity wells. And uh, old Ed Weeks goes back to work in an area around uh, Plainfield here, a bunch of lakes there in the headwaters of streams. Uh, he publishes this report, and he, he, he has this warning in there that, you know, the amount of irrigation that was on the landscape then that was probably compatible with um, healthy lakes and streams. But he said, be careful. If this landscape around here gets to the point where around certain lakes, half of the landscape is, is irrigated here, uh, there's going to be issues, and you know these these lakes are going to be drawn down by three, four, five feet during dry years, which on top of the natural drops there could be catastrophic to them. So these were uh, a bunch of lakes. Maybe some of you uh, know them east of uh, Plainfield. You see Plainfield Lake, which at that when it was mapped here. Uh, you know, had a water depth about 10 feet. Long Lake, which we're going to come back to multiple times here, had a maximum depth of about 10 to 14 feet. There's Lake Huron there, which is, which is very deep, I don't know, about 35 feet or something like that. And then there's all kind of little wetlandy kind of uh, uh, lakes in the, in the area, too. So uh, time goes on. We still haven't worried about managing our groundwater. In 1980, we got over 980 wells. 1990, you know, we're, we've crested 1,000. We're at 1,350. Year 2000, we're at 1,700. Uh, and then we have this period that needed a name, so I named it. And I'm calling it the Big Dry. The Big Dry uh, wasn't dry because there wasn't any precipitation. And in fact, as we'll look at the graph again, it was, it was fairly normal within the bounds of normal uh, highs and lows and, and averages. No, but it was during this time that we saw all kind of bad things happen uh, to lakes and streams. So just to show you again the, the big dry, you know, you compare the big dry uh, against that terrible uh, drought period from the late 40s to like the, the mid 60s. Wow, it wasn't that dry at all. And we have records from that period saying, you know, the, a lot of these lakes and streams were perfectly healthy from uh, back, back in that time, even during time of natural drought. Oh, and that's where we are now, of course, in this uh, record kind of territory. So this is what those 
uh, lakes that Ed Weeks looked like look, uh, was studying look like during the big dry. And if you look close, you can see the one on the left, Plainfield Lake, completely gone. Those little kind of shallowy, you know, wetland, lakey things, oh, they're long gone. And Long Lake there is well on its way of, of permanent drying when this picture was taken. Uh, there's a fellow named Brian Wolf who, uh, uh, a, a, a nice fellow, who isn't able to get around as much as he used to, but he took these pictures um, outside of a cabin. He, he bought the cabin in 2004. And he said, well, you know, the water levels are a little down, but they always come back. They always come back. Don't worry about it. And so he took this picture in 2004. He took this picture, I, th I think this is 2006. Used to be a trophy bass lake uh, here, and we pretty much quit being a trophy bass lake right around that time. And you know, this is, a, uh, I think, 2000. Uh, seven, the thing was uh, completely dry. Um, and there, there was some uh, misrepresentation of people saying this, this lake dries up all the time. But, you know, there's uh, folks that uh, uh, been on this lake a long time. This Marilyn uh, Willicat wrote a very touching essay about the disappearance of her lake. This is uh, a family cabin that they bought after World War II there. Um, and here, you know, she reports, we went fishing and turtle hunting, even with lower water levels during the drought years. I have pictures of us waiting during the dry years of the 50s and early 60s. The lake never got as dry as it did in 2006 and afterwards, and the fish were never killed out. Uh, in Maryland, she has these pictures of her. She's one of the young gals on the left kind of mugging for the, the camera, and I presume those are her uh, uh, folks. So one photo is dated 59, the other 66. Uh, not just, there we go, Long Lake, uh, the Little Plover River, where, thank God, our, our friend Ed Weeks put in a monitoring station there in, like, 1958 uh, and was, was active for, for decades and never came close to drying up. This is what it looked like in 2005 to 2009. It would go dry in stretches. Uh, the, uh, you know, it would be uh, dead trout littering the uh, uh, bank there and looked more like a walking path than a, than a stream. And uh, here's, here's another lake, Pickerel Lake, went through a lot of fish kills at the time. This is a picture taken from the boat landing, and the boat landing ends like 80 feet from the water uh, when this picture was taken. Uh, Wolf Lake is our uh, county park lake in uh, southeast Port Portage County, became un unusable. Uh, during that period. Uh, it, it, it's usable again now, but we went for a period from, uh, I think the park director said 2002 to 2017 or 18, where this was unusable for recreation. Uh, a dock to nowhere uh, in Pine Lake and Washera County. Uh, dried up creek, you know, more of these things here. Um, so, you know, just to be clear, with the abundant precipitation we've gotten over the whole bunch of last bunch of years here, these things are are refilled. Uh, they are even at at highs. But the point being is they should never have dried. We should have not not have seen that kind of a situation just from the amount of uh, you know because the season was kind of dry or something like that. So 2010 comes and we have 2,000 high capacity wells. And this is about where we are at present. We have 2,600 uh, high capacity wells, and you know maybe only a handful of them ever got any kind of environmental review for when uh, uh, we are going to be having too much of an impact on a lake or a, or a stream. So uh, sometimes people say, "What are you picking on the farmers for?" Uh, it's like, well. <laughs> uh, not that I want to. My good friend Justin Isher was listening to this at home. I don't pick on him too much. Uh, but, but this is where the water is getting used here. Irrigation is uh, 85, this during a normal year, about 85% of the high capacity well pumpage in the central sands. Wet years, certainly a lower percentage. Dry years, uh, a, a, a higher percentage. 2013, when we made this graph, that was pretty much an average kind of year. But we pumped 74 billion gallons in the central sands, and it's a lot of water. 
Uh, the other categories here, certainly they're all capable of contributing to uh, depletion of lakes, dep depletion of streams, but um, except in the case of the little plover, they've, they've pretty much always been a very small impact. Little plover is about, I think, 25% uh, industrial municipal. The rest of that is irrigation. What do we use this irrigation water for, by the uh, way? You know, uh, people seem to have a sense it's potatoes, 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 but the major irrigated crop is, is corn. Um, and you know, corn goes for uh, ethanol, uh, high fructose corn syrup, and, 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 and animal feed, and, and that's all, all good. Uh, potatoes, of course, you know, per, important part of the economy, and then quite a number of, of other rods and ends here. So that, that's what we use the water for. Um, at this point, I used to, at one time, I, I did a lot of the work on this uh, since 2006 or 2008, but now many, many others have gotten into the, uh, a, a ball game here. I used to explain my methodology, and now I don't do that anymore. I'm asking to take the word of me and you know the other uh, scientists that have done a whole bunch of work on this at the United States Geological Survey and the Geological Natural History Survey. Uh, this is pretty good. This is this is pretty hard science here, but we. Uh, we estimate, you see this long kind of uh, shape in here. So this is a drawdown map. Uh, so it's the pattern of how much high capacity wells are lowering the water table uh, in, in the central sands here. So that turquoise kind of color there, it's a half a foot or less. And you see the big bullseye there uh, at the county line between Portage and Washera County. You know, that's getting on five feet. Now this is an underestimate. In my business, you don't want to overestimate anything. Uh, and the other part of it is, you know, it's a 1999 to 2008 average. It wasn't even taking account the uh, uh, wettest years. But this is what the pattern looks like, that we have this long north-south kind of a, a feature here. And the lakes uh, that, that, that are within that, these are the ones that are impacted. So the folks here, not those at home, I guess, um, uh, that's not showing up. Okay, never mind. But the uh, you know, the long lake and all that is sort of in the uh, the second reddest zone over there, which explains you know why we saw huge impacts there. Streams are harder to show you on a map. Um, you know when we when we try to project a a map with streams on here. So this is just a little chunk of. Uh, the central sands, it's actually southwest Portage, northwest uh, Washera counties. It's how much stream flow is missing from these streams from, from pumping. And uh, the red is uh, 25 to 50 percent in these, in these headwaters uh, of a lot of these streams. And Minnesota biologists, they use a criteria that 10 percent is plenty to take out of a stream before you have bad effects. So, you know, a lot of these are in bad shape, even to the point is that they're normally dry these days, although not this year, right? No. Um, let's talk about policy and politics over groundwater pumping here a little bit. So the uh, great journalist Lee Bergquist, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, I'm afraid he's retired, that's really a shame, uh, did a, a great bunch of articles on this thing. And he talked about our situation being a a war over water in the, in the land of plenty. When you start viewing this as a, a contest or a war uh, between parties, it kind of makes a lot more sense and is, is easier to explain. So let's, let's talk about, you know, what are the, what are the, the, the sides and the strategies of the, uh, I hate to use the word, but combatants uh, in, in this thing. So on the one side, there are, Well, let's first talk about what's the war over. Um, the war is over this, these two propositions here, that high capacity well pumping should be unlimited, unmanaged, and without re regard for impacts on lakes and streams and wetlands. So anybody that wants to pump groundwater can pump as much as they, they want. Or the other side of this is uh, by a, a number of water advocates is that groundwater pumping should be allowed 
It should be managed in amounts consistent with the public right and health of lakes and streams and, and, and wetlands. So these are the positions of the, the two parties. Uh, the advocates for the unlimited, unmanaged side uh, over here, that would be the Wisconsin Potato Vegetable Grower Association uh, and allies with the Wisconsin uh, 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 Dairy Business Association, manufacturers and, and, and commerce over there too. They, in turn, have allies in the uh, legislature that, uh, you know, there's certain kind of legislators that uh, think any kind of regulation is an infringement on, on people's rights. And so, you know, an infringement on, on pumping fits with that kind of legislative philosophy. Um, they also had allies with the previous governor and the previous attorney general. Uh, over this side, you know, the people that are arguing for allowed and managed in amounts consistent with the uh, public right and the health of the water bodies uh, tend to be a, a fairly ragtag uh, a, a bunch that are from lake associations, uh, like Friends of Mere Shadow would be an example, Friends of Little Plover, Friends of Tomorrow Wapaka, uh, who have kind of banded together as an umbrella organization. They get some assistance from uh, environmental organizations in, 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 in Madison. Um, they've done very well in the, uh, the courts. You know, the courts look at the, the history of water management in Wisconsin, and, and the, the, the courts have said, well, well, I'll tell you what the court said here just a, a, a little bit here. Um, perhaps they have at least someone who's sympathetic in the current attorney general. Of course, the, um, you know, the legislature hasn't, hasn't changed meaningfully, so uh, nothing has happened over there. So these are the sides. Here's the, uh, the contesting parties. It sounds so much better than combatants. And you know, we'll talk about how this thing proceeded. Come on. There we go. So when did this war start? I think we could say that it started in 2011 with a ruling by the Supreme Court, a unanimous ruling, 7-0. Uh, before the Beulah decision, we had this thing. And this is only about new wells. It's not talking about existing wells on the landscape. Anybody can get an approval for a new high-capacity well, pump all the groundwater they want, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what the Supreme Court said, and again, it only applies to new wells here, that the DNR must consider the environmental impact of a proposed high-capacity well when presented with sufficient concrete scientific evidence here. So the Supreme Court saying, you know, no DNR. You know that groundwater is attached to surface water, and that when people pump groundwater, it's having these surface water effects. Uh, we, we hold all the surface water of the state to be a, a, a public resource, uh, subject to pub, public trust. You got a duty here. You need to do something. So I think it happened in 2011 is where you'd say this new war was ignited. Well, right away, here, we, you know, we start seeing efforts to chip away at this. So uh, in 2013, there's a motion in the state budget. The state budget is where you put in anything that you don't think you can get during the regular term or you don't want people to to see. So uh, Representative Dan LeMayhew uh, got something put in there that said, and he's from Krivitz, I don't know why he cared so much about this, but uh, a person may not challenge a high capacity well, basically if we have to worry about the cumulative effects. So we know that, you know, one well does a certain amount, 10 wells does, does 10 times that. And, and, you know, I think they were looking that we want DNR to have as little authority here. So Nobody can sue the DNR about this, is what it says. Well, this is news to me, because I think you can sue the DNR about doggone anything, right? Um, but uh, this, this was in the budget bill. Well, that was just kind of the, uh, the, the start of it here. Um, DNR, hey, remember that, you know, the last administration uh, was reluctant to use um, authorities that it, that it had. Uh, and so DNR was only going to be looking at one well at a time. They're not going to look that there's 2,700 wells on the central sands. They'll say, what does that one well done? Well, that one well is only going to take it down a half an inch. Uh, yeah, but all the other ones have already taken it down five feet. Where do you stop this? 
uh, and a judge ruled on this, like DNR, you know, you know better. Uh, you have the authority to consider cumulative impacts. The failure to consider is a gap in public trust enforcement. So that's the next stage of this thing. Uh, and then we see chipping away and criticism at um, a water advocate group. So th this is a, a, a fellow, I kind of think to be, of him as a friend, Andy Wallendahl with the Potato and Vegetable Growers Association. He teamed up to write uh, this editorial in the journal Sentinel, uh, kind of trashing the lake and stream advocates. They are untruthful. They're irresponsible environmental act activists. We, we are responsible active environmentalists. They have no evidence pumping is causing problems. So ignore all the studies that have been, been done. And we have studies showing nothing is changing. Groundwater levels are constant. Of course they're not. We know they go up and down, even if it's only for precipitation. And by this time, we already had a good scientific basis to know what pumping was doing. <clears throat> the, the growers came out with a book, like it was called High Capacity Wells Fact Book. The question marks are mine. Um, it was a 60-page book, and it was dropped off at every legislative office uh, in, in the state capitol. And I believe it was given to every county board, one copy for every court county board member in all of the, the central sands. And then the uh, Potato Grower Association, they started going around making presentations. Uh, and then I'd get invited in to give another presentation, which was sort of interesting. But you know, this was an intercept of an uh, email. The main goal, uh, said the executive director, is to head off local activist pressure. Uh, that's going to have a negative effect on our legislative efforts. So it's like, oh, where are they going with the legislative efforts? So the, the press sniffed this out and, and it was uh, exposed at that time. Uh, here's some of the false facts that were in this book. They were saying that irrigation water comes from some, I wrote magic up here. That's not their word, that's mine. Magic aquifer, deep aquifer, it's magic because no one's seen it. Uh, and it all, you know, they put the water on the ground, it all seeps back to the aquifer. The plants don't use any of it. Uh, so there's, they, they literally said this, so irrigation actually increases stream flows. I go, well, come on. Uh, how could that be? And then they, they blame trees. And we can get out historic air photos, stuff of like the little plover area. There's no more trees there than there was in, the, in 1960, right? When during the drought, the little plover river flowed just, just fine. And then they took a kick at the researchers here that they're beyond their expertise here. And it wasn't just me. Now they're talking about guys that have uh, uh, national and international reputations. Um, the, the Attorney General Schimmel did something interesting here that would take me way too long to e explain. This is a case that's still uh, is sitting in the Supreme Court, been sitting there for two years. Uh, if and when they're going to take it up, I don't know. But they said, DNR, forget that the Supreme Court told you you had to enforce the public trust. I'm going to write an uh, opinion that says, no, you can't. And, you know, uh, because, you know, we have one party in power there, uh, a secretary step, and DNR said, yeah, okay, that's what he said, and the governor was so for, uh, was uh, all, all good with it. And so I think for a period of two plus years, um, DNR stopped reviewing high capacity well applications like the Supreme Court told them to. They've started again because the new attorney general um, uh, withdrew that o o opinion, but in the meantime, over 700 high capacity wells were put in without any kind of a review. Uh, and then we had 2017 Act 10, um, a big collision between water advocates and water, water uh, pumping interests here. Uh, There's a, a number of things in there. <clears throat> and what, what did this act do? First of all, it made high capacity well permits permanent. That prior to this time, DNR always represented that we can modify these things when they, uh, when, when they come to blah, 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 blah. Uh, legislature took that away. No, these are permanent. The second thing that it did is that, at least arguably, high capacity wells get the ability to buy and sell high cap capacity well approvals with land transfers. And some attorneys are concerned that arguably this gives them ownership of the public water for the first time in Wisconsin history. 
that, you know, if you can buy something and you could sell something, it sure seems like you own it, right? Uh, and, you know, some attorneys are, are con concerned that this is the direction that, uh, uh, that, that, that this is going. Um, more new well approvals, uh, most new well approvals are virtually automatic. And the last one here is that more study, study is a great way to keep progress from happening, and a political process of moving toward groundwater management in certain stressed areas. Okay, let me catch my breath for a second. Well, I'm letting the, the tension build. We really want to know what this is. So we're in the middle of that last one right now. So let's look what happened here. <clears throat> uh, the, the study you told, the legislature told the in our st study high capacity well impacts on three lakes, Plainfield and Long that we saw before and one that's a little south called Pleasant, plus any other area water body DNR seeks to determine that pumping is impacting. So there's another uh, couple dozen lakes in there and you know, dozens of stream miles that, in my opinion, needed study. And then they are supposed to determine if special measures are needed. In other words, let's manage pumping as a remedy to pumping impacts. Well, that sounds pretty good so far, right? Uh, then DNR is supposed to hold hearings, write a report, <clears throat> but then this is where it gets kind of shaky. Drop it off at the legislature. You know, it, it sounds like uh, an unwanted puppy. You know, put this on the on the steps and walk away with it. Maybe we'll look at it, maybe we, we won't. So what had happened here in actuality, uh, it, and it was rumored that the, some powerful interests here got this thing scoped way down instead of covering a couple of dozen lakes uh, and many stream miles, the study got limited to just the three lakes. Uh, the business about if special uh, measures are needed uh, that's something that's still in, in, uh, in progress here. Uh, hearings will happen uh, next March, and you know June is when they'll drop this thing off uh, at the legislature and see if the legislature is in, inclined to let us start managing groundwater. I want to say just a few words about this, this study here. Um, you know, being an emeritus guy, I'm kind of a bit player in the research world on, on this anymore. So, you know, I, I chime in and uh, I'm, I'm managing a, a monitoring program for uh, stream flows and things like that uh, w with folks at UW Stevens Point. But what does it say? We got 30 some scientists involved in this. These are uh, uh, colleagues that I've, I've had for a long time, uh, some of them. And, well, some of them are rather youthful too, but these are, are people with big reputations, not just in Wisconsin but in the uh, country, country and then globally. Uh, these are people that are doing very good work. There is a new crew of hydrogeologists, those are groundwater scientists, at, at DNR. Uh, and I, I, I have the utmost uh, faith in their capabilities to, to do things, where, what, they're, what they're able to do. That doesn't mean we agree all the time, but there are good folks working on, on this thing. So, uh, you know, there's just some statistics here about how, how much data they're putting this thing. They're drilling holes. They're looking at well logs from existing wells and there's stream flow measurements going on and they're doing some chemistry things with the lakes because when you pump groundwater and less water's going in the lake, you mess with its chemistry too. And that could have a impact on the critters that, that live there. So th this study will be a good thing. Um, they're starting to dribble out a little bit of the results right now. I'll be uh, you know, chiming in as, as, as that happens, and, you know, but the study will be good. What the recommendations are about how much we should impact these water bodies, we'll see what that looks like. And then whether the legislature decides ultimately to, to do anything here, that's the, that'll be the million dollar question. So that's where we've been with uh, high capacity wells you know, going back to where did we start this? We started this in 1930 with surface water pumping, one of the 50s uh, here. Uh, remember, people started getting excited about cigarette smoking in the 1950s, and we kind of uh, solved that one, at least, you know, warnings and things like that by the mid-90s. We've been at this even a longer time, and I, I think it's time to solve it.
Do we have any questions? I've got one. Um, have there been any instances where um, adjacent landowners are pumping so much that they affect each other's wells and they end up having to drill deeper or get in disputes over the groundwater? Yes. Uh, not in uh, this state and, and not in the central sands. If, you know, these wells are spaced, we're talking high capacity wells now, not little home wells, which don't have much effect. Um, you know, if they're spaced at quarter mile apart, something like that, th there isn't much um, effect. And, you know, the fact is for most of this high capacity well pumping, you know, so what if there's three feet of water missing? One, one farmer said, well, why do I care that the water level's three feet lower? I got ni another 97 feet to go uh, before my well is going to go dry. So in general, that, that hasn't been a problem. There have been a few... Uh, a, a home well uh, folks whose, whose wells have gone dry. At least they re report so, and at least a handful of them look reliable to me that the, the pumping has taken down water levels such that they've had to uh, redo their wells. Let me repeat that phone number for people to co uh, call in any questions they might have for George, 715-942-9919. George, I have a question. Um, when you're talking about the new high-capacity wells, are they the same capacity that the older wells are? You're talking about the numbers of wells, and it seems in my driving around um, Portage County area in Washera County that some of these newer well caps seem to be substantially larger, so are they drawing more water out? Uh, good, good question. Can everybody hear your questions? Okay. Uh, you know what? Of all the things I talked about tonight, I didn't talk about what a high-capacity well is. You know, and that's one that can pump uh, at, at least 100,000, capable of pumping at least 100,000 gallons a day. Uh, a lot of these are in the million, million four uh, gallons per day range. I don't know that they've, they've gotten bigger. I think, you know, the technology, uh, say, pre-1970s may not have been as good as it is today. So... You know, maybe those old wells had a, a more limited capacity. But I, I think pretty much uh, now what's, what's going in, uh, I think they're all pretty similar, about 1,000 gallons a minute would, would be my guess. So based on 1,000 gallons a minute, I mean, how much groundwater is there actually down there that, that, that almost 20, almost 3,000 now, I'm sure, wells can pump that amount out without damaging the water levels elsewhere, even in this wet period? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know, the one <laughs> kind of interesting time, if any time you would like people to be pumping water, be right now. You know, we see these cottages uh, that uh, are, are underwater and things, but it's, you know, it's not when we need irrigation water when, when things are, are, uh, are, are, are pretty wet. Um, and, you know, we, we know, you, know we, you, you saw some of the modeling we've done, we, we know where problems crop up and kind of at, at what densities. And most of this is just having the, the will to say we're going to want to do something about it. Thank you. We do have one more question coming, I believe, just a second. Okay. Okay, this question came from the telephone. Um, I've become aware that um, now there seems to be high capacity pumping of manure, uh, pesticides, and herbicides. Do you think this is a problem? Ah, so, you know, one thing, as long as you're putting water on uh, fields, if you have other things that you can put on uh, fields, it's, you know, it's timely. And so, <clears throat> among other things, nitrogen fertilizer is routinely put into irrigation water and uh, and, and, and applied to uh, fields, and I guess uh, I'm not aware of any particular harms that that does. And be, you know, being able to put it on with the irrigation water may mean that you don't have to put it in a, a different form where it's going to be more subject to uh, 
to leaching. I think we're pretty much out of the business of putting pesticides uh, in, in irrigation water. Um, and if we do, it's just limited to uh, uh, fumigants. But I'm, I'm not up to snuff on that. There is a, um, I, I don't know if I want to call it a, a trend just yet, but a practice where um, manure from, you, to have this technology has to be a large dairy. Uh, manure is separated into its solid part and it's to, into its liquid part. And the, uh, the, the liquid part then is, is spray irrigated sometimes on, on fields through uh, irrigation systems. Uh, you can imagine if all this works perfect, perfectly, it, it, it might work okay. Uh, you know, there's been a number of incidents and in, in documentation that I've seen of uh, people having manure sprayed uh, across the road on their mailboxes and to, uh, ditches and, and, and that kind of thing. So um, I, I don't know where we are on, on that practice and, you know, um, is it something we're walking away from or you know, are we working the, the bugs out? And I, I, I'm not familiar with that right now. There's another question coming from the phone. One moment. Actually, I've got two. Um, first question is, are the current wet and dry cycles related to El Nino and or La Nina weather patterns? Ah, uh, you know, okay. I got a daughter who's uh, 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 studying, among other things, climatology at, at UW-Madison. And uh, those cycles, I, I think, are El Nino, uh, La Nina uh, related, at least the ones we saw in the past. I don't know what the heck the current wet spell is is related to it. If it's due to the uh, you know these Pacific Ocean oscillations or, or or something else, and I look forward to talking to some of my climatology uh, colleagues and maybe learning a little more on that. Okay, the next question is: Are there areas in Wisconsin where there is uh, an overabundance of water? And I would interpret that to be flooding. Oh, and how should that be managed? Well, I mean, you know, right now with the amount of precipitation we have, I think a lot of people would think right here in the central sands, we, we have an overabundance of, of, of water right now and wish it would go away. Um, you know, one thing I tell people here, if you look at that long history that I presented, what happened after that, that uh, uh, peak precipitation era of the 1940s? Well, you know, we went into 20 years of dry times. Uh, so I don't think we can assume that we're, we're going to stay as wet as we uh, are right now indefinitely into the future. I, I wish I had a crystal ball about that. Um, you know, in terms of are there places in Wisconsin where we have literally too much water all the time? Um, I don't know. I, I think certain farmers would curse certain fields uh, that, that have a persistent wet spot that would go away. I think there's... Uh, you know, at one time there was a plan, let's drain the Horicon Marsh and uh, make, make farmland out of it. So there, you know, before people recognize the value of wetlands, uh, they, they would say, yeah, you know, we have overabundance of water here and we wish it would go. Uh, you know, but be, besides the cyclical um, uh, kind of uh, flooding periods we have, I don't know, the, you know, just the way the landscape developed in concert with how much precipitation we have. I'd say no, you know, on a regular basis, we don't have too much water. We do have another call-in question. It'll be here in just a second for you, George. While we're waiting for that question, George, um, have you any awareness of the effect of property values in terms of this loss of water, like Long Lake and those areas that have had dried up in the past and, you know, do those property values fluctuate now that the water's high this Well, the that's a very years? good question. So on, on Long Lake, um, property values did decline substantially and the, the property was reassessed at as not being late front property anymore. And there was quite a, a loss to local property taxes. Uh, you know, a lot of folks that are, are water advocates, you know, they talk about, um, the property tax value of uh, riparian properties uh, here, and it is substantial. There's a statistic, something like the 
the three percent of land that's on lakes and streams in Washera County pays thirty percent of the taxes in that county. Um, it, and so, you know, a lot of times people are thinking this is environment versus economy. But I really look at it, yeah, okay, it is environment versus economy, but there's also economy versus e economy going on. Uh, here, you know, the value of, of, of crop production versus the value of crop of um, uh, uh, tourism, uh, uh, property tax values, you know. People who live on lakes that are only there part of the year use very few services, but they pay boatloads of um, property taxes here. So e the economics here is an important question. Here's a question. Why are there so many high cap wells in central Wisconsin? And are there other areas of the state that also have a, a, a large number of those wells? Ah, uh, one thing I don't like, there's a trend on uh, talk radio when they have somebody and they go, oh, good question. But that was a good question. Um, in central Wisconsin, it's because the, the, uh, the soils are too droughty uh, to support good pr uh, crop production all by themselves. And, you know, we, we have an aquifer near to the surface that's very productive. So, you know, there's, there are soils that could use irrigation uh, to, to help uh, produce economic value. There's a groundwater resource there that's not that difficult or even expensive to get at. Um, bang bang, you know, it would be surprising if it if if it if it didn't happen. Uh, and yes, other parts of the state are are seeing development, but not to the uh, the, the size of what we have here. So Anigo, you know, you drive around there, you see a lot of high capacity wells. Rice Lake, uh, the Lower Wisconsin River Valley. Um, I gave a talk in Park Rapids, Michigan, a place where irrigation pumping is, is booming, uh, uh, and they're trying to get some grips on it. But all the way over there, there'd be these little sandy pocket areas here, and the landscape was quite, quite irrigated over there. So, um, and, and now, you know, what we're even seeing in some of the silt loam uh, soils in more southern Wisconsin, people are installing uh, irrigation equipment there. So. Uh, it makes it almost uh, even more imperative that we start thinking about how to deal with this. Here's another one. What is the correlation between increased groundwater withdrawal and agricultural production or crop yields? Oh, well, there's a big one. Um, uh, you know, an yeah, irrigated friend of, uh, irrigated farmer friend of mine, uh, he got uh, 200 some bushels per acre on irrigated land this year, and he got uh, about 120 on adjacent um, non-irrigated land. Now, he'll give you a caveat that he had different varieties, and the non-irrigated one was shorter season and all these kind of things, but the, uh, the yield bump there is, uh, is, is, is quite clear that, that, uh, uh, that, 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 that you'll see it on a regular basis. Did I answer the whole question? Okay, good. Whew. Got a couple more. Um, one caller said that his understanding was that um, these high cap wells are very deep, maybe as much as a thousand feet. Oh. And um, he's wondering why something in an aquifer that deep would affect a lake that's maybe only 10 feet deep oh, at the surface. Oh, okay, interesting. Um, it, I think it's pretty rare for the, I, I, I should say, maybe a typical irrigation well is 60 feet deep. There's no water to be uh, taken out. You know, we, we have generally maybe about 100 feet, 150 feet of sand saturated with water. We go below that and into the granite. There's, there's no water there to extract. So you need to be in the surficial aquifer. And even though if you're pumping at the bottom of the aquifer, you know, you're still dropping the water level from the, from the top. Um, you, you, you just can't pump from the bottom and nothing happens to the to the top, this, this whole thing is connected. Um, you know, it'd be like, I don't know, maybe having a, a bathtub and then pumping water out of the bottom of it and not ex expecting that you're gonna see the surface water uh, uh, go, go down. So th these things are very intimately connected. Okay, and then another caller uh, is developing a philosophy or an idea that there should be a plan for drought um, similar like what we have now for COVID or maybe should have for COVID, where there's different levels of, of management 
um, in both permitting and the use, depending on what the current conditions are. It is, is something like that in the works, and is it feasible to execute? Uh, the first part, the second part of it, is it feasible? Yes. Um, and, and this would make a ton of sense, wouldn't it? Wouldn't. And, and hopefully this will be in the DNR's recommendations in this report here. But, you know, given how wet it is, um, uh, and I shouldn't make these kind of predictions, but okay, I will. You know, I, I think water levels in lakes and streams and wetlands and in the aquifer are going to be staying high uh, for a while here. And so why not when we have uh, all, all this water available here? Yeah, if it's a dry summer next year, go ahead and irrigate, and probably everything will, will be fine. Um, the DNR scientists working you know, with university ones are looking at what's the threshold on these various lakes before we start damaging them. So you might be able to uh, go two feet below average, and the fish are fine, everything else, but you go five feet below average, okay, you, you got a, a dead fish in, in a lake you can't use anymore. So the question is there, you know, when should you start throttling that system back? Um, I, I think that would be a very good uh, thing to, to think about. Well, plenty of water, uh, sure, uh, go ahead and use it, but we have to ratchet it back. Um, problems with that is, is how do you ratchet it back? Do you say, well, um, out west with prior appropriation, the people that got their well, uh, their, their water permits first, uh, they are the last ones to lose their, uh, their, their water pumping ability. The ones that got their water permits uh, last, those are the first ones to cut off. So is that what we would do? We'd uh, cut those off by kind of seniority, who's been in the system the longest? Um, or do we say, well, everybody has access and we're gonna ratchet you all down together? Uh, my favorite idea is that, yeah, okay, uh, say for every irrigated acre someone has, you get X amount of water. Um, and then we're gonna ratchet you back if, if times get dry, but then there's some sort of way, some kind of mechanism that people can trade and buy water credits for each other. So you can imagine George has a cornfield next to his buddy Justin who's got potatoes that year. I'm not gonna make that much money on the, the cornfield. Justin has the ability, a way more investment in those potatoes. Uh, he's got way more need to have water in there. So maybe he comes and sees me and said, I'm in a bind here, how about selling me some water and I'm gonna compensate you for having poor yield on your corn crop. You know, we, we can kind of think about mechanisms like that where we could be doing uh, a, a trading and purchases of, of these kind of, kind of things. I, I don't think it's rocket science. Okay, here's a kind of fundamental question. What is the difference between an aquifer and a water table? Ah, very good. So an aquifer is the geology that, that uh, uh, holds groundwater. So we know that, you know, in the the soil that there's water in there, but it doesn't flow, you can't pump it out uh, with a well. But if you keep going through the soil, you get to the zone that we talked about being saturated, that all the little spaces between the sand grains are, are, are full of water, and that's what we can pump. And that's the aquifer, the uh, geology that's saturated with water. The water table is the, the top of the groundwater, or if you, if you want, the, the top of the aquifer. Uh, and sometimes we use these, these things a little interchangeably, but we should be a little more careful. Are there any other questions from any of uh, the audience who are here? And we have no more online questions and no more from the phone. So we thank you, Mr. Kraft, uh, for your presentation this Thank evening. you very much. It's been fun.